Welcome to this module, Benefits of a Trust. We're going to be discussing the benefits of utilizing a trust in order to acquire and preserve wealth. Some of the benefits include protecting and preserving your assets. And you are actually preventing your assets from being taken away during lawsuits, judgments, and liens. Another benefit is customizing and controlling your wealth distribution. So let's say that you are distributing wealth to three individuals, your three children. This actually helps you customize it because everything is laid out in the trust. And let's just say that you want the eldest to hold 50% and the other two children to hold 25% of beneficial interest for the trust then that is gonna help you when it comes to you transferring or distributing the wealth within the trust. Next, it can help you minimize your federal and state taxes. So the business trust that we use is a 508C1A trust, and it is considered a faith-based organization with the IRS. So you actually reduce your tax liability down to zero, and you are not required by law to pay any taxes or report any taxes. Next is transfer of wealth and privacy. With a trust, you remain 100% private as far as your assets. So no one can look you up on the public records to see what you own. That is very powerful. And then it helps you transfer your wealth seamlessly because you don't have to go through court systems or anything like that in order for the ownership to be transferred because the ownership is going to stay within the trust. It helps a parent or relative manage their financial affairs. So let's just say that your parent would like for you to own the house when they are deceased. Then you can actually put their house under a trust and then you can, um, you will then become the beneficiary or the trustee, whichever position you want to put yourself in, and you can help them manage their financial affairs through the trust. Another benefit is trusts can avoid probate process. The probate process can actually go on for years. I've heard of some probate processes going as far as five and 10 years. So you want to avoid this because if you are transferring wealth, one thing is that you want your loved ones to receive that wealth as soon as possible or to be able to benefit or capitalize from that money or those assets as soon as possible. So you want to avoid the probate process because believe it or not, the probate process can be very expensive because you have to pay the judges, you have to pay lawyers, you have to pay court fees. You want to avoid this as much as possible because sometimes the probate actually ends up taking a very large chunk, sometimes more than half of your entire estate. So if you were gonna leave your children a million dollars, now because they have to go through probate because you didn't have the right financial tools when it comes to you transferring your wealth, then they now are probably going to get 500,000 instead of that $1 million that you decided to leave them. All right, so now let's talk about the protection against, right? The trust is going to protect you against lawsuits, judgments, and liens. So let's just say that somebody decides to sue you. Well, that is actually going to protect you against a lawsuit or against um, against a judgment from that lawsuit because they are suing the individual. They are not suing the um, actual entity. So for example, it can protect you in both ways. Let's just say that the house is owned under a trust and let's just say you have a tenant and they have a slip and fall. Then at that point in time, they can actually sue the owner of the house. So now if the, if the house was in your personal name, then they would sue you and they would take the house. If the house is under a trust, they don't know who the owner is, so they can only sue the trust. But because the trust 
falls under trust law and contract law, um, it cannot be in the jurisdiction within your state. So it has to go up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court more than likely will not pierce the trust. So more than likely they will just, you know, throw out the case. So that's one way that you can protect yourself against judgments or liens or uh, lawsuits. Um, divorce, right? Divorce is can be a little sticky sometimes. And so one example of you protecting yourself against divorce is, let's just say, and I'll give you a live example. Let's just say that you are getting a divorce and your spouse only knows of the one house that you own together, right? Your primary residence. Then in fact, what they can do is they'll be able to be entitled to half of that house because of, um, because of the marital status. So what you can do is let's just say that you had an investment property or one or two or three. What you can do is you can actually transfer that property into a trust or you can buy it into a trust and now that property will not come up under the divorce settlements or you know under the divorce because the attorney is is going to be looking for your assets they're going to be scrutinizing your finances and so this can actually help you conceal your finances because you can hide money in your trust bank account in your brokerage account and you can hide your homes and cars from your spouse um, by having the entity own those assets heavy taxation so we um, just spoke about that briefly you are, when it comes to the business trust, you're going to be executing a 508C1A trust. And this trust falls under the, um, the same jurisdiction as a 501C3. So it is a nonprofit organization. And what you are entitled to is one, you do not have to report any of your income when it comes to your business. And two, that means that since you don't report, you don't file taxes, okay? And if you don't file taxes, that means that you are not subject to heavy taxation like people in other states like New York and California where half of their income is being um, taken away due to taxes. So if you avoid heavy taxation, then you are actually saving that 50% and you can use that now in order to reinvest and acquire more assets, okay? So that is actually putting you in a very good position. Next is foreclosures. So a home, let's just say it's your primary residence and you decide that you're falling behind on making payments, then at this point in time, what's going to happen is the bank is going to initiate a foreclosure. But with this foreclosure, they are not foreclosing on you as a natural person. What they are doing is they're gonna be foreclosing on your entity, which is a trust. But because we have contract law, then once it goes to litigation through the Supreme Court, it's going to be very hard for that bank to be able to foreclose on you because it's under an entity and it's under a trust, okay? Bankruptcies. So the same thing for foreclosures is what happens with bankruptcies. You have limited liability. And so if you decide to go through bankruptcy with your trust, then the um, the creditors cannot go after any of the assets that you acquired with your trust. So another way is, let's just say that you had a bunch of assets on your personal name. So for example, let's just say that you had a house and a car under your personal name and you transferred both of those assets into your trust name. Then what will happen is 
that they will not be able to come after those assets because those assets are now owned under a trust and they're not owned under you anymore. So if you do file for bankruptcy under your personal name, then those assets were already um, transferred into your entity and you will not be liable in order to pay back those assets. And lastly is probate, which we just discussed. So you want to avoid probate as much as possible. You do not want your family to go through probate at the time of your expiration. So what you want to do is you do not want to use a will in order to transfer assets because a will is just actually giving the judge permission to decide who gets what. So you want to avoid the court system in its entirety. And the way you do that is by transferring your assets, utilizing a trust, and all the ownership stays within the trust. So let's just say that you had four houses and they're all owned by your private family trust. Once you pass away, there's nothing that the beneficiaries have to do because the trust already owns the assets. So they're still going to be collecting that rental income and it's still going to be distributed to them on a monthly or quarterly basis. And there is absolutely nothing that needs to be done because the beneficiaries own the trust, which own the assets which they are benefiting from. That is the position that you want to put yourself in. You want to put yourself in the position of stewardship instead of ownership. So stewardship is when you own nothing, but you control everything. So let's just say we have 80 years on this earth, right? And you own a total of 10 houses. Your main objective is to control those 10 houses. It's to manage the funds and income that comes from those houses. Or let's just say you own 10 cars and they're being rented on Toro, right? Your objective is to own and operate those cars so that you are collecting, you know, income for your trust. And so you don't want to be in the position to where you own all 10 of those cars or you own all 10 of those houses. The position that you want to be in is that you control all 10 of those cars. You control all 10 of those houses. That's putting you in a position of stewardship, which is a way better position to be in than ownership because ownership makes you liable and it makes you a target. It makes you a low-hanging fruit for a lawyer or a judge that decides that they want a judgment against you, okay? Now let's talk about wealth. This is one of the best ways in order for you to build wealth. Why? Because what, what we will be discussing later is how to build credit utilizing this entity and then once you have that credit, you can use those funds in order to invest and build wealth. So this is a tool that you definitely want to take advantage of when it comes to building wealth. And lastly is preservation, right? Because a lot of us were so focused on making the money. We are so focused on acquiring the wealth, but we never think about how we are going to preserve and replenish the wealth. How are we going to make this wealth last for generations to come? Do you want your wealth to only last for, let's just say, two generations? Or do you want it to last, you know, 150 years, 250 years to where it lasts four and five generations? There are families today where their wealth is up on the seventh and eighth generation and that can be you but you have to use the right tools in order to be able to preserve your wealth and so one of the tools that we use is insurance life insurance because the humans which are the beneficiaries are the actual assets right you have human assets and then you have physical assets because the beneficiaries are actual human assets, you want to protect your interest. And so what you're gonna do is you're going to put a life insurance policy on every single beneficiary of that trust. And you're gonna put a life insurance policy on all of those heirs, all, all of their heirs, because their heirs 
are going to be beneficiaries, if not already, of the trust. So whenever someone is born into the family, the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to put a life insurance policy on them because the trust is going to own the life insurance policy. And once that human person or or benefit and once that beneficiary or human asset passes away then that death benefit is actually going to go to the trust and it's going to replenish the trust so that's how you're able to preserve the wealth because one family member passes away and the trust gets a death benefit of three four five six seven eight you know million dollars from that passing okay so we will continue to discuss preservation in another section. This is the end of this module.